or the key points that we are trying to reach out here and we, are, we will try uh, to explain is, of course, environmental journalism, climate communication, which is a new concept nowadays in, as a scientific discipline, then is climate disinformation, a major concern in our time, meaning our social media time somehow, and of course, how to produce climate stories. In this context, there are four general topics with which we will try to explain today. Of course, when we talk about environmental journalism, we are much more concerned with its history and activism. And then we, are, we will try to define what is climate communication. Then, uh, as part of climate communication, it's what we call climate disinformation, and we, are, we will try to explain the practices on countering and combating climate disinformation. And the last topics which we will try to explain is how to identify, communicate and produce climate stories. So this is a basic thing. Of course, to define environmental journalism, we have first to understand what, what does it do? What does a, a, an, an environmental journalist do? Of course, he has first to identify an environmental issue. And then he has to communicate, meaning he has to produce an environmental story. And then the other step somehow is to distribute it. And nowadays, with the development of social media, of course, the distribution of environmental stories is much more far. It can reach larger audiences. And of course, what an environmental journalist has to keep in mind, he has to be or he has to have a critical approach when in respect to environmental issue the, and the way that people or ecosystems or biodiversity are uh, related to this. Of course, one major um, part of environmental journalism is what we call environmental communication. So this is a broad term, but as you can see on the PowerPoint, uh, what it does concern, it is it is about the dissemination of information and the implementation of communication practices, practices sorry, that normally are related to the environment. There is of great importance environmental communication. Of course, that what does it do is that it shapes public opinion on environmental issues, on pressing environmental issues nowadays. It does sharpen knowledge of everyone including scientists. Of course, it is it enhance understanding in order to spread awareness and of course to create healthy attitudes or healthy behaviors in regarding on in relation to the environment. Of course, when we say it shapes ideologies, we will see that there is a difference between or in the spectrum, ideological and political spectrum of everyone who is involved with climate communication and which somehow is a passive importer of climate communication. I will try to explain some short history of climate communication and of course, somehow of climate, of climate journalism. It started somehow in America, in the US. And there are some important names, naturalists or writers or authors related to climate, to, sorry, to environmental communication. Of course, there was a tradition, what we call of nature writing. So the, there is this aid of nature. And of course, to protect the nature, to, to conserve the nature somehow, you have to be an advocate for the nature. So the story of climate, of environmental communication started with advocating for the preservation or conservation of nature. In the first, in the beginning of 20th century and in the late 20th century, environmental journalism, environmental communication became a distinctive field. There was a book, maybe you have heard of it. It, it is called Silent Spring, wrote by Rachel Carson, which is a famous, which was a famous author and a famous biologist. In, in this book, she wrote about the risks of pesticide to human health. What we see at this period is the fact that, for example, there was a great awareness of the public regarding the effect of pesticides on their health. And therefore, 
the public was very active. The public made protests. The, the public, meaning the people, uh, formed grassroots environmental organizations. They influence police policy decisions of their government. And of course, they were concerned for the public for the first time was concerned regarding the pollution and health risks of pesticides. And of course, another major theme that we will see, it will uh, uh, appear again in our times is loss of biodiversity. Here are some photos from the major protest and a major media outlets regarding the awareness of the people regarding or in relation to the environmental pressing issue of that time. In the late 19, there was a famous uh, American environmentalist, author, and journalist. It, it, he, he, was called, he is called William McKibben. And his rise and his book, sorry, uh, The Rise of Greenhouses, Gas, and Our Warming Earth was an alarm, was a, a thing that sh uh, shook the, the public opinion regarding the effect of global warming on people and on ecosystem. Of course, we now, uh, and you have heard in media in everywhere regarding climate change. Climate change is, uh, is for sure the pressing issue of our time. Climate change is caused by the global temperature which are rising up. The consequences are far more dangerous. Ice is melting, there, there is a loss of biodiversity, there is a pollution, air pollution, of course, which impacts who? Us, humans, and of course, the environment that we live in. What we know from now is that the public, the awareness of public is getting, is rising. For example, from a Pew Research center survey there was some it was uh, it was stated that 70 percent of the people asked people which lived in north america europe and the asia pacific region expressed some concern that they will be personally harmed by the climate change impact or by the climate change consequences when i talked before about the shaping of ideology that means that it is like a fact that the major, uh, the people who left are left leaning on the political spectrum are likely to be more concerned that global warming and climate change will harm them personally. In, uh, for example, the, the people which lean on the right spectrum of, of political spectrum, I mean, they are not so well concerned. They are not so concerned. These findings, of course, are troubling. And we will see why. But when we speak about the history of environmental journalism, of climate communication, of environmental communication, we have to see the history of how big companies has manipulated lives. Who? The public. Even though the awareness, sorry, even though the awareness of public was high, it is high. There are always some practices, manipulating practices. And the first study case was in the 50s by Big Tobacco, which uh, the PR that worked in Big Tobacco financed writers, financed journalists to write, to, to make uh, visible the fact that the, the major concern of Big Tobacco was the health of the people. So this is, that is this memo, which has a famous catchphrase, a, a famous catchphrase, which is, doubt is our product, meaning that by spreading doubt, those times they spread doubt by using traditional media. They try to uh, create a controversy. So they try to make pe people doubt, to doubt regarding, in this, in this context, regarding the influence of tobacco in, in their health. Of course, this is a, not a new situation. A major problem like climate change, of course, it is caused, as we all know, by fossil fuels. The same tactics, the same practices are used now by oil companies. And of course, their 
uh, mm, the major concern here is to cast doubt on climate science. There are many people among us which do not believe that climate change is happening. And this is, of course, uh, due to their belief, due to their values, but of course, it is part of a major campaign of manipulation, which cast doubts and then stall regulation for greenhouses gases. There is this famous article wrote by the Harvard historian and scientist Naomi Oreska. Naomi Oreska, sorry. And she understands that even 98% of the scientists know that climate change is happening and these consequences can be a tragedy to people and to ecosystems. Even though, because of the mass manipulation, mass propaganda by oil companies or other actors involved. They try to discredit science. They erode public trust in science. And of course, they engage in mis misinformation and disinformation spread. Of course, in I try to, mm, mm, to line the major tactics used. Of course, that when a scientist say that climate change is happening, big companies paid other scientists to conduct counterfeit science. Of course, some scientists which speaks or who speaks are harassed. They try to buy credibility by the scientists. They influence policy. Maybe this is one of the major problems we are facing as journalists. And of course, they try to manufacture uncertainty or to cast doubt or, as we say, the triumph of doubt. Nowadays, we see, we've seen the birth of environmental journalism. Now we see the climate journalism. Of course, this is a kind of journalism which is more focused on climate issue or, or on climate uh, science somehow. Of course, there is a major coverage now of the climate change science in media. And the major reportings are done from climate summits and conventions. It does contribute, of course, climate journalism, one of its main functions is to contribute to the public deba debate sorry, on climate crisis. The major topics now that we're talking of climate journalism are related to especially sustainability, biodiversity, and renew renewable energies. Of course, there are some indicators on how to conduct climate communication on how to be a climate journalist. You can see there that, for example, you have to be uh, trustworthy. So meaning a journalist need to have a balanced, um, a balanced approach, a critical approach, but he has to be trustworthy to the public. Of course, to be trustworthy, you have to be based on facts. You have to be scientific. Of course, you have to be transparent. You have to say which are uh, who financed you? You have to see somehow to be, sorry, balanced when you are pressing a climate story. Regarding the presentation of it somehow, it has, of course, to be clear, to be coherent, to be contextual. Of course, nowadays with the social media development, of course, it is more simple for us as a journalist or, or, or as a science communicator to interact with our audience, audience, for example, using Twitter, using Facebook. And of course, one of the most important thing to make climate communication much more effective is to be connected with the society. We have to be connected with the people which are affected by this, uh, by climate consequences. If we define climate communication, it refers and involves practicing regarding the causes, of course. The nature, these are the two, the causes and the nature are, of course, based on science and the effects of climate change. There are some theories regarding climate communication. We know now that climate communication is part of a major umbrella, which is called environmental communication. But these theories concern climate communication. What we have to keep in mind is the fact that regarding the use of facts, when, for example, we are debating with someone, when, for example, 
uh, we are trying to make a story about an imp the impacts of climate change. We know that people which are listening to us are not always convinced by our facts. People based their worldview in their beliefs, in their values, so meaning they are not like scientists. To create a climate story, to make an effective climate communication, we have to take in consideration the beliefs, the values, the norms, the people or the audience have. In this context, when we uh, communicate about the natural world, when we communicate about the climate, we have to keep in mind that people construct their own theories, that people does produce their own theories or their own, own worldview regarding, regarding sorry, climate changes. As we've, we uh, have told before, um, there is an increasing climate change coverage, co coverage nowadays. Of course, we know that media attention to climate change has risen. And of course, in step with the increasing public awareness. So we are more aware now for the climate change, that climate change is happening. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, acceptance of climate change is not growing equally across the political spectrum. We all live now in the post-truth era. It was the, the Oxford Dictionary International Award of the Year in 2016. We mentioned earlier, uh, unfortunately, ob objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. As journalists, as science communicators, as climate communicators, as environmental communicators, this is a major problem. And we will see why. Because of social media, one of the factor, factors which uh, involves or which influence um, this kind of doubt, this kind of uh, uncertainty is the use of social media. We all use social media and we can see by the here, for example, that Facebook is like one of the most used social media daily. In Albania, for example, uh, it is true that Facebook is the most used social media according to our, to our data. And of course, nowadays, uh, especially the younger generation is using TikTok, Twitter, may, uh, normally in Balkans and in Europe is not much more used, but even LinkedIn. But we know that Facebook and TikTok has like billions of users. Of course, traditional media, as, is, as, it, as it is called, is different. We had editors, we had professional journalists, but now with social media, the spreading of climate information the spreading of environmental information has differed a lot. We know that in social media, for example, there are no barriers to entry. We all can register ourselves and open a social media account. There are no gatekeepers. Of course, if we do, or if I make a, a fascinating post, it can potentially reach to large audiences. And we know that any one of us can publish anything, anytime. And of course, there are no privacy or copyright. For example, what we have seen, there was this famous study which analyzed 100 English language videos related to climate change, which were featured, featured on TikTok. And only eight of the 100 videos included information from a reputable source, meaning that the videos that which were posted on TikTok. They were all based on false information. They were not based on scientific information regarding climate change. And on the other hand, we have seen that climate misinformation in Facebook received like 1.4 million view times daily, which is a major, it is a major concern for all of us. Um, now, nowadays, social media 
has created some problems which were not seen before. For example, using algorithms, social media can spread misinformation, can spread disinformation regarding climate change, of course. And there are created those we call echo chambers, meaning that people who are aligned with our beliefs, with our values, with our worldview regarding climate change, of course, that uh, they create some chamber. So meaning that that, cre that creates polarization. When we mm, are drawn to posts which are similar to our worldview, of course, it, there is a more, much more intention for us to share it. So these all are risks which have not been seen before. On the other hand, with the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning, there is this great risk of mass manipulation. And of course, the role of environmental journalists, the role of climate journalists, which are part of environmental journalists, now is beginning to fade. With the use, for example, of deep fakes news or deep fake videos, you can take a famous scientist, for example, make a deep fake video in which he says, for example, the climate change are not real, are a conspiracy, or, or conspiracy. So are like a magic sometimes, something. And of course, one of the problems of artificial intelligence is what we call the increasing of disparity on information. We do not have, all of us, we do not have the same amount of entering. I mean amount by this, I mean um, the same access of entering and gaining true information because of the use of machine learning and because of the use of algorithms. Nowadays, it's not only plastic pollution, it's not only air pollution, it's even what we call information pollution. So when information is correct, correct, it's um, science-based, it does not create problems. But there are two kinds of information pollution which we need to take in consideration when we speak about the role that an environmental journalist can have. These are called misinformation and disinformation. As you can see, for example, which is the difference between misinformation and disinformation? Normally misinformation, it is misleading, but the person who creates it does not intend to deceive other persons. In disinformation, of course, that the information regarding, for example, a climate change fact, a climate change consequence, it is misleading. But the problem is that this disinformation is intended to deceive the people. What does, what, what, we, what we do in our everyday life? We spread normally much more misinformation. We do, not that, we do not know that this, if this information is real or not. We do not want to deceive the others. We take this information for granted and then we spread it. But this information is different. Which are the actors involved in this information? We will see that the actors, of course, are what we call the PR machine. Normally, disinformation strategies are created by PR professional who works on big companies. We know that their aim is to undermine and question the scientific consensus. And of course, to highlight scientific uncertainty and to attack scientists, to undermine their credibility. So this is a major problem. And these are the actors involved. You can see, for example, that corporate or big companies are the actors involved. They, they form somehow, or sometimes foundations, uh, they form some mm, societies which produce misinformation and disinformation. This society can be political or religious organization, can be grassroots organization and campaigns, and of course, those scientists, which in fact are pseudo-scientists, they are not real scientists. And this misinformation, 
information. And this disinformation, of course, goes in, uh, in uh, not goes, it goes through somehow the media, especially social media. And therefore, it is spreading all around. The algorithm work, the machine learning work, and in this case, the public gets influenced by the actors and the, and the first actors involved and creates not a scientific based information regarding environmental issues or climate change consequences. How does it spread? It spreads through social media. You can spread false and misleading content. A story can have a, a false and misleading content, a story about mm, environmental issue, a story about a leak can have misleading content. Of course, we accept the content. We share the content. We accept it not because uh, we want to mislead. We can accept somehow or sometimes because we do believe that this content is real. Of course, by using social media, the, uh, the rhythm of spreading it is much more higher. And in this case, it does occur, occur the, the, uh, that thing which we call contamination of social media ecosystem. And of course, always, the big companies does what we call greenwashing. Of course, the fossil fuel industry has perpetrated a multi-decade, multi-billion disinformation propaganda and lobbying campaign. That is called greenwashing. For example, when we see a fossil fuel company, we say, for example, that we are concerned for you. We as a journalist, we as a communicator should be really concerned that they are not concerned for us. But we should be really concerned to understand which is the purpose of this greenwashing. And of course, it does matter. Greenwashing does matter. Climate disinformation does matter. Climate misinformation does matter. Why? Because undermines scientific authority and, and institution. We have seen with the pandemics, for example, that people were not inclined to believe the scientific authority were not inclined to believe state institutions, were not inclined to believe politicians. Of course, it matters because it is an obstacle to meaningful climate action. We know that by, by spreading climate disinformation, of course, we get passive. There is another risk, the growth of anti-science rhetoric. Nowadays, the younger generation are much more skeptics about the science, are much more skeptic about the scientists, are much more skeptics about climate change. Of course, when we uh, are, mm, are far away, are not, uh, are not uh, collaborating with scientists, what does happen? We reduce our support for healthy environmental policies. We do not agree. Of course, we are confused. Public confusion is, is everywhere somehow. Regarding for the fact that climate journalists are not uh, explaining to the public, are not staying together with the public, are not expressing the concern of the public regarding climate change consequences. And of course, it does increase polarization between us. There are some ways, of course, to counter climate disinformation. This way involves verbal, personal, interpersonal, visual, auditory communication. Which are the ways? Of course, that as a climate journalist, as a climate communicator, as an activist of for major environmental issue, we have to be certain we have to um, to follow the scientific method in this context we need to search for facts we need to introduce interview scientists we need to be aware that there are some problems with the greenwashing 
we need to be aware that, of course, there are problems with social media today. And, of course, we need to make this conclusion in order to produce a meaningful story, in order to produce a story which relates to the people, which relates to their concerns. Of course, there is a major problem. What should we do and versus what we are doing? There are some tips for anyone who like to be to get involved as a journalist regarding climate change or other environmental issues. Of course, that when we write a story, we do not need to write controversial terms. We don't do not need to use much more jargon, science jargon, to use like science terms, because the, the people, the public, the audience can be confused. Of course, we have to be focused when we write climate stories on the issue impacts. How does, for example, mm, a, a, mm, a rainy day, a rainy day, like not a rainy day, a rainy week, which is part of the climate change, how does it impact the community living near a river? Of course, which is now getting a major attraction is to focus on solutions. Nowadays, it is this kind, of, another kind of, another type, sorry, of journalism, which are called solution, which is called solution journalism. It is very important to focus on solution. Why? Because when we focus on solution, people don't get passive. People don't get pessimist. And of course, we have to take in consideration consideration the fact that audiences need to relate need to relate why because us as a climate scientist as a climate journalist as a climate communicator we need to make a story which is worthy for the community or communities affecting it it must be worthy because if not so people are not getting attention people are not paying attention to you and of course, while we take in consideration all these things, we have to put the facts first. We have to take in consideration the science which stays behind a climate change story, which stays behind an environmental issues. Of course, we have to focus on people. People are very important. You all have seen, for example, problems in the uh, Amazon basin in Brazil. Of course, it is important to rescue biodiversity, but it's much more important also to focus on the people which live there, to focus on the fact that biodiversity loss can cause a cascade of reaction to the people which are based on biodiversity. Of course, one of the major tips when you write a climate story is to have attention to equity and justice. That is called climate justice. We do know that, for example, people living in uh, not in wealthy communities, poor people, are much more affected by climate change consequences. This is very important to keep in mind as a journalist. We have to protect the people. You know that we have to be what? We have to be climate uh, journalists. But also, we have to be humans, meaning that we have to take in consideration the problems that affect poor people, pe marginalized communities that we all seen around. Of course, that to understand, to protect the people, we have to have a conversation with them. A journalist nowadays is not only a person who puts facts first, no. A journalist today regarding climate change or regarding other environmental issues is also a person who what? Who takes in consideration the problems, the consequences of climate change on people's everyday life. And of course, one of the tips in order to create a good climate story is of course to avoid the problematic narrative. Always, when you read something about climate change or an environmental issue, there is this sense of alarmism. 
there is this sense of problematic narrative. It is important, of course, to raise awareness, but it is important to raise awareness. And additionally, it is important to keep a balanced narrative. A balanced narrative means in this fact that we do not have to exaggerate. No, we have to put first facts, scientific facts, and then, of course, to relate to people, to relate to our audiences. And what is essential when we produce a climate story? Of course, as we mentioned, to the presence of a credible information. Where do we get this information? We get this information by the scientists. That is very important. What is essential in producing a climate story? To strengthen climate literacy among the public. Who can do it? Of course, the schools do it. University, high school do it. But even the journalist, even the climate communicator do it. Climate literacy meaning in this fact that we need the public to understand, to have the knowledge of climate change science. Of course, one major tip in what is essential to produce in a climate story, what is essential for us as journalists, is to strengthen media literacy among the audiences. And of course, to train future journalists on the science of climate change. What do we understand at this point? We understand that in order to produce a climate story, we have to put the facts first, keep in mind the people, keep in mind climate justice, keep in mind marginalized communities, keep in mind poor people, keep in mind the fact that it's very important as a journalist not only to put facts and the people, but also to have a sense of climate literacy, meaning that as a journalist, we need to be trained as what? As a climate, somehow as a climate change scientist. And of course, when we have this capacity, when we do know um, climate change science, and in, uh, additionally, we do have media literacy concepts, keys, basic, we can also uh, educate the audiences. Of course, that to produce the climate stories, we have, to, we have to take in consideration the communication tools that we have to use. When we speak about communication tools, we have to take in consideration the fact that the language must be clear, must be basic, must be factual, must be contextual. And of course, we have to somehow um, choose an attractive scientific subject. By attractive, I mean, uh, attractive, I mean not only a necessary uh, scientific subject, but also to be attractive to the audience which is listening to you or which is reading to you. Of course, the audience does listen, does listen if you adapt the message to it. And when you use our Facebook page, our Twitter page, page our TikTok page, whatever, we have to put credible information. We have to be very uh, careful about not spreading misinformation. When we check an information on climate change or when we check an information regarding an environmental issue, we have to check it. We don't know, we don't do not have to make or to have all the information like to be that to be certain about it. No. And in the era of social media and in the era of machine learning, of artificial intelligence, to be careful is a duty. And of course, we can use YouTube to present content on climate change. We do know, for example, that people are more attracted to visual information, auditory or visual information. And YouTube is a major tool, is a very important tool to use to, to communicate climate stories or environmental stories. Of course, that we said that people now, it is much more easier somehow, because people now are much more concerned with, with climate change. And you can see on the tables here uh, that 
there are two major facts somehow. For example, when we see the Balkans, we can see Greece now, which is near us. Greece, for example, like it has uh, like 50, uh, uh, yes, 57 percent of the people of Greek people, I mean, they are very concerned that climate change will personally harm them during their lifetimes. Maybe some of you may question, why does this happen? If you see in the media, if you have taken, for example, if you've seen television, read, uh, read newspaper about the Greek, in Greek, uh, Greek has many problems with fire. What happens here? What can we understand by this? The fact that people are much more aware normally when uh, environmental issue happen to them, are much more aware that it could be contextual, are much more aware or are much more concerned when climate change consequences affect them. On the other part of the table, you can see the fact that, as we mentioned earlier, that people who are leaning on the left spectrum, political spectrum, are much more inclined to believe the fact that climate change happens and, of course, to be concerned about the personal harm, harm of climate change than those on the right political spectrum. Even though, which is, I believe that is a very hopeful news, the fact that younger adults and younger people tend to be more concerned than, old, than older counterparts that climate change will harm them. That is a very hopeful fact. Of course, that nowadays it is created those, this thing that we call climate anxiety. Younger generation are much more inclined to go to protest, are much more inclined to believe in science regarding climate change and its consequences on, on their life. And at the end, I want to say that as Joseph Pulitzer put it, when you produce a story, when you create a story regarding several environmental issues or climate change consequences, you have to put it briefly, you have to, to put it clearly, and of course, to be as much more accurate as you possibly can, because it is very important, even though to put the facts first, but also to take in consideration people's beliefs and their emotion regarding climate change consequences in their life. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so everyone who has a question. Oh. Just there are many questions here. Um, okay, uh, Dobrila Mocevic, I'm sorry if I don't say it right, wrote to the chat. Yes, she is very right because Dobrila says, says that as a communication pra practitioner, I will keep on fighting and insisting that the profession ethics is our first line of defense. Of course, we all know that we, be, we have to be very ethical in everyone's profession in order for us to understand, to, to give uh, the people uh, not only what they want, but what is scientific accurately what they want. And of course, she's right when she, she said, for example, that we need to strengthen cooperation between science and communication, or PR, if you like, in order to make a difference. Of course, this, this is this major problems nowadays. For example, it is better to be a scientist and then to learn how to produce stories or vice versa, for, for example, to be a first a journalist 
and then to to read or to learn about uh, climate change, for example. This is a, um, a long debate. I, for example, I am mm, first an anthropologist, which like to write. So meaning that normally I, I write about the things that I know, but we don't know yet. It is better for me, for example, or for every one of you, to be first a journalist and then learn about the topics. By learning, I mean really learning, and then to write about it. So that is a long debate. Uh, okay. Thank you all for your kind words. Now, maybe it is the time for us to explain um, what we have to do in my so meaning you have first, I don't know if you have read it, but you have to, during this week, you have to um, for, fill a test. Yes, of course, sorry. Uh, Instagram is also, yes, you are very right. A good platform for visual and audio presentation. Yes. So you have a test with 10 questions regarding climate change, climate communication, environmental journalism, and climate uh, journalism. And then you have to produce a story, a short story, of course, um, where you, a short story about the climate change consequences in the place that you live. Because that you are forming groups, I believe that you should choose between you uh, the place that you want to take in consideration and to write a, a, like a 500 short story, 500 words, I mean, short story about a climate change, climate change impact on the people. You should take always in consideration, of course, uh, climate injustice. Uh, sorry. Uh, so the bill I said, but this, but this is not about, in my opinion, who will write the story, but to learn, share, and use the knowledge to change the way organizations are doing in terms of their impact. Well, uh, I don't know what you mean by organization in this case, but um, of course, the role of stories is also to make some impacts. Of course, that's what, what does a journalist does. The, the role of a journalist, especially in our pressing times, the role of a climate uh, journalist is, of course, to, uh, to be advocate and to impact the public opinions regarding climate change consequences. That is a role, it is like an activist. So today, uh, climate journalists, today environmental journalists are like activists. And we, we know, but we have statistics, for example, that especially in the Latin America, there are the, the number of uh, environmental journalists killed is very high. That is because they are advocating to protect. Uh, of course, it the PR, but by PR in uh, uh, tobacco companies before and by PR in oil companies before to be uh, to be a PR is not to be a journalist. It's another different thing. To be a PR, you have to sell a product. To be a journalist, you have you do not have to sell a product. You have to state the facts and the truth. That is my opinion. If we had, if you have other questions, I'm willing to answer to you. You can write it on the chat. Uh, oh, sorry. Mm. Mm. 
Yes, that is a very intelligent question. How to be visible or influential on Facebook when your media owner doesn't invest in boosting your post? Mm. Well, um, there are some, if I understand correct the question, um, there are some, uh, Facebook, for example, is trying to put down disinformation content or regarding climate change and whatever other content and misinformation content. If I understand it correctly, I can, um, I don't know what you mean by media owner. You mean Facebook, for example, or all the, fa or the, the, the media that you work in? I'm not, I'm sorry, but. Um, of course, that if, if you mean media owner, that means the, peop the people or the one that you are working for, uh, he does not have to invest to boost your part. Uh, we can create, uh, if you are a journalist, for example, you can create a profile on your own. Ah, yes, okay, media where, where we, you can create a profile of your own, especially Twitter is used in, in US to create a profile of your own as a communicator or as a scientist. For example, me, I created a web kind of web page on WordPress in which I write uh, different stories regarding human evolution, climate change consequences. So uh, we don't we do not we do not have to be like uh, related to our media owner. It depends on the interest or who finds media owner. That's the problem. So as Noam Chomsky put it before, it is a problem who finance media. So I believe that the only solution, in my opinion, as I'm understanding from your question, is to create a profilic, your own profile on social media and to have an um, interacting uh, communication always with your audience or with the followers. You do not. You do not have to be uh, to expect from your media owner. The problem of the media today is the problem of financing. We don't know who finance media, so we know somehow, but not any, every time. If there is another question, Our limitation on Facebook is 5,000 friends. Well, you can open a page. I believe so. I'm not very keen in using social media I, because I live in Albania. And in Albania, for example, traditional media is still used very much, meaning that people are also affected by television. So I prefer, for example, when I have an important topic which I want to make visible to an audience, I prefer going to traditional television, to the state television, for example, or to private television, because uh, in my country, Albanians are much more keen to listen to the television, to the news and whatever. Of course, they do use social media. Of course, they do use F Facebook. So that, that depends on where you are living and which are the, the main media used by, by, uh, by your people somehow, your people meaning by your co-citizens. I'm not very keen in using social media. Yeah, yes, you're right. I believe so. Even in Serbia, I've been there. Even in Greece, I've been there, yeah. In Croatia too. They, in Macedonia, yeah, I've, when I went to the, to the house of my friends, they have all the television like open and listening to the news. So I believe that traditional media or Newspaper are still selling in Albania. Of course, this media landscape will change. We know that, but we'll wait. If mm -hmm. I see, I'm editor yeah. on my broadcast. Mm. Yes, 
I don't know. That is, we have to create something new. We have to be creative in this regard. I don't know, Madam. I can give you a correct answer. I never minded it on that. I don't know, uh, for example, the use of podcasts in, in Albania is, is beginning now. For example, I, I did, me and, and my colleague, of course, did a few podcasts on climate change, for example, for journalists. And it is not much more, it is not used so much. So it's like the beginning. I don't know which are the tools that you can use to, to make visible your information, meaning your stories and whatever. A Twitch channel, yeah. Maria knows, of course. Younger generation knows better. Do you have any? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is very, yeah, you are right. Environmental issue and climate change are not attractive topics. And that is a problem not only in the Balkans, but even in Europe or in US, unless there is some serious issues. That is true. But that's what we have to do as journalists, to find a way, or as science communicators, or climate communicators, whatever. We have to find a way to make the information attractive. So it has not to be attractive. It has to be true. The people nowadays have lost their sense of truthful. That is a big problem. So in this regard, it is hard to make an attractive climate change story. It is hard, that is true. So we have to choose the right words in this regard. We have to choose the right tools or mean, meaning the right media. But that depends. We have to choose the right time when to, for example, uh, in television, you have to go in the morning or in the afternoon. What do people expect? Meaning that we have to understand not only what people want, but we have to somehow inject in the people other interest by by finding the right tool by writing the best story um, by trying to be concise by trying not to be so long when you write the story that's that's how i choose it and i believe that people are much more inclined to have sorry a short information concentrated which click their minds yes of course we can discuss the assignment the first assignment is uh, uh, like you have to form a group like four to five people and to create or to create, yes, a climate story. The climate story must, must be based, a climate story meaning or environmental story in your case. Um, you have to choose uh, which climate story to take in your region, meaning in your city or in your village, wherever you live. And in this case, we have to produce a short story, like for 500 words, and to pass it to me. And I will uh, uh, um, evaluate you for, for your uh, climate story or environmental story. You can choose it. And the other assignment is a test uh, with alternatives, meaning uh, or, uh, you have 10 questions and they are simple question, of course. They are like they are based on the lecture that I did it before. So these are your two assignments. But I will I'm I'm sure that you will be great in each of those because they are simple. You have to produce a story. That story has to be somehow attractive. It has to be based on facts. You have the structure of the story. It is written so. You have to make an introduction, for example, when you write an essay, a story, meaning in this context. Um, you have to uh, base your, your, uh, your introduction on facts, for example, and then, then you have to reach some conclusions. You can choose your own story in your own region, and you can choose it between you. I'm not. So, Vlad then say two oldest target groups yeah, on Croatian TV. And three times more numerous than two youngest. Yeah. Young people don't look TV news. You are right, and we know that, but young people, of course, are much more inclined to social media, including us. But uh, anyhow, uh, in the Balkans, I believe that uh, 
traditional TV is, is used much more than in other parts of Europe, I guess so. I don't have exact numbers for that, but we do read. In Albania, for, for example, in Croatia, they do not read newspaper anymore. In Albania, people do read newspaper, of course, even online. Okay, yeah. Yes. If you find evidence, of course. Of course. Normally, there are many evidence for every region in the Balkans. The, by evidence, I mean reports, which says, for example, that Balkan is, a, uh, is uh, the, uh, the climate change is threatening Balkans, for example, by fires, storms. So in this context. It has to be short and concise. It's important that you get something which is interesting for all of us. And which is, of course, mm, focused on people. We are much more interested on the people. As an anthropologist, I am much more in, on that. <coughs> if you have any other questions. Anyway, we will be in touch in chat regarding the assignments, but I'm more interested if you have any other question regarding the lecture. So, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for listening to me. Uh, we will be, of course, in touch. I wish you a, a good evening and a good week. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks. Bye.